All right, everybody, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you're watching this. I'm Dr. Kaz, and I would like to finish up our Chapter 5 uh, lab material uh, or course lab material for the tissues. Some of this material we will repeat in lecture, which is good because repetition does help facilitate the learning process. So uh, without further ado, let's get into simple columnar epithelium. All right, keep it in mind when we're talking about columnar and simple and our classification nomenclature for epithelium. Simple, again, just to review, um, is going to represent one cell layer. Okay, stratified represents two or more. Second name or word in the title here uh, is columnar. Columnar tells you the shape of the cells that are going to be involved. Columnar means these cells are taller than they are wide. The nucleus is located closer to the base of their portion or the bottom portion of the cell and that the nucleus is going to be uh, having a, a kind of an oval or egg-like appearance, okay? So that being said, um, these uh, cells or this type of epithelium is ideal. It's great for secretion, right, if we were going to secrete like saliva, for example, uh, and for absorption. Remember, simple epithelium is only one cell layer thick, so it's wonderful to have things cross uh, through the cell layer for filtration, absorption, and then secretion also. Okay, there's two forms, non-ciliated and ciliated. So we're going to start with the non-ciliated type. All right, the non-ciliated type, obviously being non-ciliated, does not contain any cilia, which is a hair-like uh, apical surface uh, modification of the plasma membrane of the cell. All right, and it has microvilli. Now, on um, a microscope slide, all right, the microvilli kind of appears like a fuzzy-like structure. So therefore, we call it the brush border. And within this epithelium, we have our unicellular glands, the goblet cells, all right? And they're called a goblet cell because they're, they're similar in shape to a wine glass or a goblet, all right? And so they produce this glycoprotein mucin, which is a wonderful uh, uh, glycoprotein because when it mixes with water, it creates mucus. And there's several uh, um, uh, advantages to having that. One, in the digestive tract, it helps to cut down on friction, okay? And also when we're getting those... Uh, acidic uh, um, secretions from the stomach mixed with the food, all right, that's not ideal to come in contact with the digestive wall. So the, the mucus helps to neutralize or decrease, or actually, actually in this case, actually increase the pH or decrease the acidity of the stomach contents there, okay? So we're gonna find this type of epithelium pretty much throughout most of the digestive tract, pretty much from the stomach, all right, to the anus. Okay, and so down here you can see on our slide from the from the book. All right, here's our goblet cell. All right, and you, if you look close enough, this kind of darkish pink top here to the cells. That's your brush border. That is going to be your microvilli. All right, and the purpose of the microvilli is to increase the absorption area. Okay, it helps to increase the absorption area. I'm skipping around here. Hold on. There we go. All right, the second type of simple columnar epithelium is the ciliated. So obviously, if it's ciliated, we will have cilia right, on the apical surface there. And remember, cilia ha has to do with movement, all right? But the cell will remain stationary, whereas the cilia will brush or move things past it, okay? And in this case, all right, it's going to move the mucus, <clears throat> excuse me, much like I have right now, it's going to move the mucus along that the goblet cells have been producing, all right? Now, this type of cilia, you'll see quite a bit of it in the respiratory tract, all right, in our bronchioles, and also in our reproductive tract in the uterine tubes, all right? It's, if you think about it, all right, when it's time for ovulation and the, the oocyte is released from the ovary, <clears throat> all right, the oocyte is the egg, when it's released from the ovary, all right, it doesn't know where to go, all right? There's no flagellum on it. It has no ability to get into the uterus, so... All right, the uterine tubes or the fallopian tubes are lined with this type of epithelium, and those cilia beat it, not literally on top, but beat in the direction, all right, of the uterus, so it kind of sweeps the oocyte down into the uterus. It's really quite cool. It takes about six days for that journey, all right? <clears throat> it seems like a long time, but then again, you're a tiny small cell, all right, just trying to make your way, and you have no way of doing it without the help of the cilia. All right, our next type of epithelium is our pseudostratified columnar epithelium. Excuse me for one second. <clears throat> the pseudostratified, 
all right, falsely stratified. It will appear to be many layers, but it's not, all right? So as you recall, all right, if you're one single layer of epithelium, that means that all the cells in that layer, all of them will make contact, direct contact in this case, with the basement membrane, okay? But the nuclei are scattered in, 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 a, in a fashion um, that gives it the appearance that it is stratified, okay? So some nuclei will appear to be higher than others and lower than others. And so that gives us the idea, oh, that looks like it's stratified, but in actuality, it is not. And finally, one of the more important aspects or, 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 or characteristics of this epithelium is not all the cells make it to the top, okay? All of them are attached to the basement membrane, but not all of them make it to the top. All right, so there's two forms, like we saw previously. We have a ciliated and a non-ciliated, all right, type of pseudostratified columnar epithelium. So obviously, if we're dealing with ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium, that means we have cilia, all right? And the cilia, again, their job is to move stuff, all right? And in this case, they're going to move the mucus that is being produced by the goblet cells, all right? And this type of epithelium is going to have a protective role, okay? So again, we'll see this in the larger passageways of the respiratory system, all right? We saw the ciliated uh, stratified columnar epithelium earlier, all right? And that was in the bronchioles. Those are the smaller respiratory passageways, all right? This, is, this type of epithelium is going to be found in the larger respiratory passageways. And it's great because when it's producing mucus, all right, when you're inhaling a material or air, but you'll also be inhaling material in that air, all right, especially if you live in a, in, in a city, all right, which the pollution rates are a little bit higher, all right, that mucus is going to trap foreign particles. And right? we just don't want that sitting there, all right, because if it's just sitting there, that's problematic for us because it can cause all sorts of issues. So the mucus will trap the foreign particles and then the cilia will sweep the, that mucus away, all right, from the lungs. Most likely, you'll you'll feel it in your throat, and that's usually cause it, that will cause the coughing reflex. You'll try to cough it up, and you have one of two ways to get rid of it. You can either expel it by spitting it out, blowing your nose, whatever, or you can swallow it down. Okay. All right. The other type of of uh, pseudo stratified columnar epithelium is going to be our non ciliated. This is the rare stuff. All right. So again, if it's non ciliated, it does not have cilia, and the cilia then do not have since there's no cilia. We don't need goblet cells, all right, because it would be a bad luck for us if we had goblet cells, but no means of moving the mucus around, okay? So if you don't have cilia, you won't have goblet cells. So this type of epithelium is protective, once again, all right? You don't see it in very many places, but you will see it in the male urethra and then the epididymis, which is that ridge-like structure that sits on top of the male testes, okay? So you can kind of see here in our slide, right, the, the nuclei, all right, appear to give us the stratified appearance because you see some up high, some down low. All of this epithelium is making contact with the basement membrane, but not all the epithelium is making it to the apical surface there, okay? All right, <clears throat> let's talk about our stratified squamous epithelium, okay? He's talking about stratified epithelium, okay? Stratified epithelium, there's two types, okay? There's non-keratinized and keratinized, all right? The keratinized we'll talk more about when we get into the skin, all right? Keratin is a protective protein. And if you've watched the, the lab identification uh, video for this, I talk about that a little bit, okay? But once the cell produces keratin, it kills itself, okay? So it's a suicide mission, all right? It's called apoptosis when the cell kills itself. Um, it's a valiant, valiant effort because it's produced the keratin to try to increase the, the, the cell strength, make it a tougher cell, and then unfortunately it dies in the process because that keratin starts to destroy all the cell organelles, and destroys the nucleus. Once you don't have the nucleus, you're pretty much uh, dead in the water, all right? In this case, you're a dead cell, okay? So non-keratinized, all the cells, all right, will be living, okay? So if you watch the, the identification video, I told you that you'll find this type of epithelium near the entrances of your body and the exits of your body. They'll be also found in, in moist regions like your mouth, all right, your anus, the vagina, all right. You'll find it in these areas where there's some sort of uh, moisture, mainly from the secretions, 
all right, of the mucus and saliva there, okay? Obviously, no keratin will be uh, present in these, all right? So you should see the nuclei. They should be visible when you're looking at this, all right, on a slide, okay? So keep in mind, just remember, you'll find this in areas that are entrances or exits to your body, oral cavity, part of the pharynx, which is going to be your throat, the esophagus, vagina, and the anus, okay? <clears throat> All right, the next type of epithelium, right, like I said, we'll talk about the keratinized uh, stratified epithelium more in the skin chapter in chapter six. All right, but the stratified cuboidal epithelium, again, stratified two or more layers, all right, we'll have a square shaped uh, uh, cell, all right, you will find this, all right, in the tubes, all right, a lot in, around the kidneys and coverings, all right, of structures. So again, it's going to offer protection and secretion, right? So we'll see it in the walls of ducts of glands, specifically exocrine glands. Exocrine glands are glands that have a duct, okay? So you have a, in these exocrine glands, that's actually the, the definition, all right? Exocrine glands are glands with ducts, and then endocrine glands are what we call ductless glands, okay? So you will find this type of epithelium in our sweat glands, all right? And you'll find them in parts of the male urethra and in our, the ovarian follicles in the ovary there, okay? So we'll talk about that a little bit more in the reproductive system in, in bio 2, 10, 11, excuse me, okay? So if you look down here at our picture, you can kind of see here the representation. You've got our stratified cuboidal epithelium lining, all right, the lumen here of a duct of something, okay? <clears throat> All right, then we have our stratified columnar epithelium. This is another rare type of epithelium. All right, the pseudostratified, we saw that the pseudostratified ciliate, non ciliated, excuse me, uh, uh, epithelium was rare. So is the stratified columnar epithelium. Okay, so this type of epithelium also has the role of protection and secretion. All right, but we'll find this in the large ducts of our salivary glands. Okay, and again, in parts of the male urethra. All right, so this one here, you can kind of see if you're looking. All right, again, I know it can be confusing, and, uh, and I'm with you on this. I mean, histologists are pretty much the only people that really are any good at uh, telling the difference uh, between the pseudostratified columnar epithelium and the stratified columnar epithelium. It's really difficult. And um, like I said, just for lack of... Uh, uh, of a better situation, you're, you're probably just going to want to have to memorize the slides in that case, unless we give you information on the test as to, all right, we obtained this sample from, all right, the uh, uh, parotid gland, which is a large gland for a uh, uh, salivary gland in the mouth, and we give you a little more detail, kind of telling you the location, and then that will help you to determine whether it's pseudostratified or stratified. <clears throat> But that is tough. So again, um, we try to avoid that, having you make that determination there. Okay. And then finally, all right, our last type of epithelium is going to be the transitional epithelium. <clears throat> okay. This is the transformer epithelium. All right. So this is pretty much in the urinary uh, 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 system, mainly in the uh, urinary bladder. Okay. And the shape of the cell, the appearance of the cell, is mainly determined by what state it's in, if it's in a relaxed state or if it's in a stretched state. All right? And that depends on uh, your urine levels. If you have a lot of urine in your bladder, you have a full bladder, quote unquote, then you're going to be in a stretched state. Okay? And if you're in a stretched state, all of that urine is going to flatten the apical cells. All right? I'll show you a picture here in a second. If you just emptied your bladder, you just went to the bathroom, then you're going to enter into the relaxed state. All right, so the apical cells are going to be nicely rounded and large, okay? And the bottom cells, the basal cells, will appear kind of in a cuboidal shape or what we call a polyhedral shape. All right, but one of the big characteristics of this type of epithelium is called binucleated cells. You'll have two nuclei inside a cell. It almost looks like, uh, we nicknamed it owl's eyes. If you ever look at an owl, it looks similar to the owl's eyes, okay? So we look here on our slide, all right, I'm going to zoom in on this one, and we can see, okay, here we are, 
Here we are in the relaxed state. So you can see the apical cells are nice and rounded here, all right, pretty big. As we move down towards the bottom, all right, it's tough to tell, but the bottom cells are going to be more cuboidal or polyhedral. All right, you can look on this diagram here. It's a little bit easier. See, nice rounded. We get down to the bottom. They're closer to cuboidal, what we call the polyhedral, kind of odd shaped. But when your, your, your bladder is full, okay, because of all the urine that's piled in there, all right, those apical cells just get flattened out. They almost have like a kind of a squamous uh, similarity, <clears throat> okay? So you'll be able to tell. And I don't have a very good slide here, all right, with the owl's eyes. Let me see if I can zoom in a little bit more. It's tough to see. Here's one. Here's a cell with the owl's eyes. There's two nuclei within the cell. Okay, here's another one. Here's one here. Here's one here. All right, here's one here. Here's one here. Okay, so those are binucleated. Okay. All right, wipe your forehead, wipe the sweat off your forehead. We've just completed, all right, our uh, epithelium here. All right, so thank goodness. I just want to jump into glands real quick. We've got a couple slides here on glands, and then we'll get into uh, the next type of tissue because remember, we still have three more tissue types to cover. All right, remember, there's four tissue types in the human body. The first, epithelial tissue. The second, connective tissue. The third, muscle tissue. And the fourth is nervous tissue. Okay? All right. So what's a gland? A gland can be one single cell or many cells, all right, that have a common function. All right, that's the definition of a tissue, right? Okay? So it can be uh, one single cell or many cells, all right? made up of epithelial tissue, all right, they have a common function, all right, and mainly it's for secretion, okay? They're gonna secrete, they're gonna make something, synthesize something and secrete it. And there's two types, endocrine and exocrine. You hear me talking about it before, all right? Our endocrine, those lack ducts, okay? So basically their secretions, all right, have to go directly into the blood, so there better be a blood vessel nearby, or into what they call the interstitial fluid, and that's the fluid that surrounds the cell, okay? So some endocrine glands will secrete their secretions outside of their cells, right, into that interstitial fluid, and then that secretion, in this case a hormone, if we're talking about the endocrine glands, all right, that hormone will then move into a blood vessel that's nearby. All right, some are lucky and very fortunate to have a blood vessel right next door, so it sends it right into the blood. Okay, some don't have that um, that luxury, and they have to send their secretions into the neighboring interstitial fluid. The other type of exocrine uh, gland is an exocrine gland. All right, they have a duct. We're going to kind of talk more about that now. All right, endocrine. That's chapter 17. We'll talk about that later on. All right. So what had happened is with the exocrine gland formation, right? When you're developing. All right, parts of your epithelium will kind of just sink into themselves. So here's your epithelium, a nice straight line. And then what happens, it just starts to invaginate in on itself. All right, and this part here is going to create our gland here. Okay, so there's two parts to an exocrine gland. All right, you have a duct, which is kind of like this area here that's going to send the secretions out to wherever. All right, and then you've got a secretory portion, which is kind of like this big bulbous area here. All right, I'll talk about that in a moment. All right. So let's talk about, you know, the classification of some of these glands here. All right, we've already been exposed to a unicellular exocrine gland. All right, that's the goblet cell. We saw that, okay? One single cell, all right? It's going to be located close to the surface of whatever that epithelium is, and we saw that with our non-ciliated columnar epithelium and then our non-ciliated uh, pseudostratified columnar epithelium. All right, but it does not, does not contain a duct, okay? So why does it get lumped into the exocrine glands? Don't ask me, okay? But anyways, because you saw the shape of it, I mean, it literally looks like a goblet. And, and here's the surface of whatever it's getting secreted onto, all right? That's kind of what it looks like. And then the uh, nucleus is down here. And then you have all these glycoprotein molecules, or not molecules, but substances inside, okay? 
And then what we're going to be talking about today is going to be the multicellular exocrine glands. All right, so now we have several cells that are lumped together and they form this function of making something and secreting it, all right? And that is the, ex the multicellular exocrine glands, all right? So there's two parts. All right, we talked about the duct portion earlier. This is going to transport or move whatever is made, the secretions to the surface of the epithelium. Then the other part is the secretory portion, or what we call the acini. It looks like a cluster of grapes, all right? And these are the cells that make the secretions. So the acini make the secretions, and the ducts are going to transport or conduct those secretions to the surface of the epithelium, all right? Now, these multicellular exocrine glands are surrounded by a fibrous capsule. And guess what? That fibrous capsule is going to be made out of, in most cases, dense, irregular connective tissue. Anytime you hear fibrous capsule, your brain should automatically go to dense, irregular connective tissue. Okay? So, with this fibrous capsule, what happens in some cases, all right, this capsule will push in, all right, on these glands and it will separate parts of these glands into what we call lobes <clears throat> all right more on this in lecture all right i'm just kind of giving you a brief overview so it's going to uh, separate some of these parts out into lobes and in between these lobes we'll have what's called a septa which is made up of that fibrous capsule material all right so quickly on the classification of the exocrine glands on how they look, meaning their anatomical form or structure, right? You have a simple gland, and I'm gonna go back and forth between these two slides real fast. Simple glands, and as it says there, it's a single unbranched duct, so it looks like this. Here's a simple gland, okay? Here's your secretory portion of your acinus, all right? And that's gonna have an unbranched duct. That's a simple gland. All right, here's another simple gland right here. All right, the secretory portion is not branching out. This is a simple coiled gland, so it's one long tubular gland like this, but it just coils around on itself. All right, and we'll talk about the simple acinar here in a moment. All right, so simple glands are, uh, are single unbranched duct. Compound glands have branched ducts. So if we go down here, all right, and our complex compound glands, excuse me, all right, our compound glands, all right, those ducts, all right, branch. Here's a branching duct. Here's another duct that branches. Here's another duct that branches. So you have one main duct, and then it splits off into several other ducts that branch and then branch again. And if you look here at our simple, here's our main duct does not branch. Here's another main duct does not branch. See, all these do not branch, okay? So now we're going to talk about, all right, the secretory portion. If you notice, the first two, all right, parts here, the simple, come on now, the simple and the compound refer to the ducts. Simple does not branch, compound does branch. The next three parts here, all right, these three are in reference to the secretory portion, okay? So the first one is the tubular glands, all right? What that means is the secretory portion and the duct are relatively the same in the diameter, meaning, all right, if you look here, all right, it doesn't get big and, 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 and swollen. So if you look over here, you can see here the secretory portion kind of turns into a ball here, okay? And our simple tubular, the tubular stays relatively the same shape in diameter as the duct. You can see it here on our branched one, all right, and then here throughout the, the, the uh, tubular, the coiled tubular, okay? So that's gonna be for the tubular. For the acinar, the secretory portion, all right, becomes rounded or expands like a sac, like the alveoli, okay? It turns into like a ball. You can see here, all right, the secretory portion here, that reddish, outlined group of cells, that's going to be the acinar. You see it here also. Okay. And then finally, the last type is going to be the tubular acini, which is a combination of both tubular and acini, or acinar, excuse me. 
okay? You have both the tubes and the swollen portions, and you can see here, all right, here is a compound tubular, so the ducts, all right, branch, and then you have many uh, tubular uh, secretory portions. Here's your compound asini, all right, the asinar portion of it, all right, has swollen like a ball, and then you've got a mixture, all right, the compound tubular asinar, part of that secretory portion will have a tubular component, and then part of it will have that swelling or rounded area there, okay? All right, that's all I'm going to say about that. I want to get in here into the uh, connective tissue. All right, <clears throat> lots to cover. Connective tissue has a lot of stuff going on. All right, the nice thing is we'll review all this when we get into lecture. All right, so if you don't grasp it now, don't worry. When we get into lecture, uh, we'll talk about it more. <clears throat> all right, so first things first, when we talk about connective tissue, there are three, count them, three basic components. All right. The first is going to be the cells that are part of the connective tissue, okay? And then the other part is going to be the extracellular matrix. Extracellular matrix stands for the stuff that's outside the cells, all right? So when we break down what the extracellular matrix is, all right, it's made up of two things, protein fibers and ground substance, okay? So that's three components, cells, protein fibers, and ground substance. And protein fibers and ground substance then make up the extra, I'm not going to spell it out, I'm just going to spell it as EM, extra cellular, all one word, matrix. Okay? So let's start off with the first component here, which are the cells. All right? In connective tissue, all right, you will have not just one cell type, you can have many cell types, all right? And in most cases, all right, these cells will not touch each other. It might appear that they will, but most cases they won't. With epithelial tissue, all the cells touched each other. That's one of the characteristics, and we'll get into that more in lecture, but that's one of the characteristics of epithelial tissue. All the epithelial tissue is closely packed, okay, tightly, okay? So the cells make contact with one another, all right? With Connective tissue, all right, most of the cells won't make contact with, with one another, okay? So there's two classes of cells that we're going to talk about, resident, all right, or wandering cells. The latter is so pretty much self-explanatory. Those cells just kind of wander around. They move around. Resident, not so much. They stay in residence. They stay um, motionless, all right? So resident cells... Their job, since they're not going to move around, they're going to stay in their house, so to speak, then their job is to maintain that tissue, also to help support it by uh, producing whatever it is that they need to give it some support and structure. And then finally, if anything gets damaged, its job is to repair what's being uh, damaged, okay? And it repairs that extracellular matrix, which is protein fibers and ground substance, okay? So let's talk about some of these resident cells. First type are the fibroblasts. These guys are, are, are the ones that are responsible for the scar tissue that you may uh, have. All right, if you cut yourself pretty, pretty good and your tissue heals over in your skin, it might leave a scar. Well, that's thanks to the fibroblasts, right? So their job, all right, first of all, it looks like a football, all right? So the cell kind of has these two tapered ends on it, okay? And in this type of connective tissue, the first type of connective tissue, all right, connective tissue proper, all right, um, we have, all right, fibroblasts. These are the most common cell that you'll see there. And so their job is going to be repair, to repair, all right, for example, when you get scar tissue formation, that's collagen, okay? So these fibroblasts will produce the collagen that's found in that scar tissue, while at the same time, they'll also produce, that line's annoying me, all right, though at the same time, they'll also produce the ground substance, all right, which is basically these big uh, molecules, all right, proteoglycans, glycoproteins, and we'll talk about that in a moment. All right, the next type of resident cell is an adipocyte. What's that? Fat cell, all right? So we saw those in our uh, slide identification earlier, all right, but they like to cluster around one another, okay? Again, it's another type of connective tissue proper, 
right? Specifically loose connective tissue, right? So you'll see this scattered throughout adipose connective tissue, right? But keep in mind, they like to cluster. They like to hang out with one another. Oh, no. All right. Um, next type of cell is going to be, all right, our mesenchymal cells. These cells are pretty cool, all right? They are stem cells, embryonic stem cells. So when a cell gets damaged in your connective tissue, if these guys are just hanging out, they will divide, all right? And this extra cell that, that is made, all right, one of those cells after it divides is going to turn into whatever that damaged cell was, okay? So one, where you had one cell, all right, and then it divides and it gives off another cell, another mesenchymal cell, and then we'll make this like a square cell. And that was a damaged cell, all right? So the mesenchymal cell will split, It'll make another mesenchymal cell, all right, to replace the original, and then the second cell is gonna become what we call the committed cell, and that's the cell that we're replacing uh, that was damaged. Pretty cool. All right, we have fixed macrophages, one of my favorite macro uh, cells. They're a white blood cell, all right? And the fixed macrophage is the Pac-Man cell. It goes around and it gobbles things up, but it also helps to repair damaged tissue. All right, so they're all over the place, okay? And so it looks like a big blob. And then what happens is if there's a bacteria or some sort of foreign material there, it goes over to it, tries to identify it. If it doesn't identify it and it's not supposed to be there, it eats it, okay? Or if you have damaged tissue, say again, you cut yourself and there's some damaged epithelial tissue, then it's gonna go around and chop up that damaged tissue, okay? So we can repair, all right, and replace that damaged tissue. And the process of gobbling up cells, we call that phagocytizing, engulfing those cells. Now, what can happen is as it's going through this process of repairing, not repairing, but uh, eating up the damaged tissue or going around and gobbling up uh, pathogens, uh, macrophages release chemicals, okay? And these chemicals will attract other cells to the area, all right, specifically the wandering cell type. All right, to repair that damaged tissue because it can't do it on its own. So it's really kind of cool. And there's other roles for macrophages. You'll learn more about that when you get into the uh, uh, white blood cell uh, immunology chapter in uh, 211. <clears throat> All right. So that's the first type of cell to, uh, uh, classification, the resident cells. The wandering cells obviously will move around. All right. And these types of cells are largely a part of the immune system. Okay. So what they'll do is they'll go around and they will evaluate the integrity of cells that are living in the uh, connective tissue. And if they're damaged, they'll destroy them and then we can repair them or, or, or replace them, okay? So these type of cells are called leukocytes and those are the white blood cells, okay? And so their job is going to be to protect our bodies from bad things. So the first type are the mast cells. All right, and these guys like to live close to our blood vessels, okay? Because in certain situations, all right, where there's damage, and you're pretty familiar with uh, mast cells, for those of you that get runny noses or have issues with um, uh, allergies, okay, mm -hmm. and you're taking an antihistamine, these cells produce two types of secretions, all right? Heparin, which inhibits blood clotting, and histamine, which causes dilation or vasodilation of blood vessels. And that's what will happen. When you vasodilate the blood vessels, the blood vessels become leaky, and hence you can get a bloody nose, not a bloody nose, excuse me, you can get a runny nose in certain situations. It can cause other allergic re responses. All right, heparin's important because if there's damage to tissue, we need to make sure that we get the cells to the area that was damaged, and we can't have the blood vessel clotting on us right away because we can't get the cells out in time. So these mast cells will release the heparin, okay? And the heparin inhibits blood clotting. So our cells that are leaving the blood vessels to go to the damaged tissue area can get there and do their thing. And at the same time, the histamine will be released to dilate the blood vessels so we can get more blood flow to the area. So it's kind of a cool situation. But when you take an antihistamine, it causes the, vas the, the blood vessels to not vasodilate. Okay, so they don't become leaky. 
okay? Because eventually, when there's tissue damage, we don't want the cells to be leaking anymore, or the blood vessels to be leaking anymore, because we've fixed the problem, okay? We want to go back to normal. The other type of uh, cell here, of wandering cells, is the plasma cells. These guys are really cool. They start off as what we call B lymphocytes, okay? And when they come in contact, or when a chemical is released, all right, telling the immune system that it's time to invoke an immune response, the B lymphocytes will transform into plasma cells. And it's these plasma cells that make antibodies. So you've heard probably a lot about antibodies recently with this whole COVID-19 thing going on, all right? So these B lymphocytes will differentiate and transform into these plasma cells. Some will remain B lymphocytes. All right, but most will transform into the plasma cells and release those antibodies. And those antibodies are uh, these proteins that will just flood your bloodstream and travel around looking for a specific type of foreign invader, a specific type of pathogen. Okay, so in this case, if it's COVID-19, then they'll hunt down the COVID-19 and hopefully kill it. All right, another type of wandering cell, the free macrophages. Basically the same as a fixed, except they can move around, okay? So consider them mobile, and they will phagocytize those foreign materials there. A couple other types of white blood cells are going to be your neutrophils. Think of those as the uh, white blood cells that are going to kill bacteria. And then we have our T lymphocytes, all right? They like to go after um, viruses, all right? But we'll go into much more detail about what a T lymphocyte does because there's several different types. All right, when you get into immunology. But for right now, just know that the T lymphocytes are going to go around and kill foreign material. All right, the next part of our connective tissue, the first part with the cells, all right, the second part is going to be the protein fibers. And there's three types, right? You need to know these, okay? The first type is the largest and the strongest, and that's the collagen fibers. So we refer to them like a cable-like, all right, fiber. Okay, and so you'll find a lot of collagen in some of our strongest tissues of our body, our tendons and our ligaments, right? But it will be found in several other types of connective tissue. The next type of, of protein fiber are the reticular fibers, all right? They're going to be kind of like the medium shape. They're a little bit smaller than the protein, uh, excuse me, than the collagen fibers, all right? They're similar, but they'll, they can branch off whereas collagen fibers cannot branch, all right? Reticular fibers can. And these are the guys that make up the stroma. And the stromas are like this compartment that you'll see in some hollow organs, all right? Like bone um, or, or lymph nodes, spleen, your thymus gland. So think of stroma as these little compartments or rooms. The example I give in the slide identification video is going to a storage facility. You know. Go to YouTube storage, and you can store all your stuff in these little rooms and these little compartments that are part of this big building. All right? And that's what the reticular fibers will do. They'll make the walls in between these storage units. Okay. The last type of uh, protein fiber are the elastic fibers. Okay. They have tons of the protein elastin, which makes it stretchy. Okay. So these type of fibers can stretch and recoil easily. All right when we need it to uh, return to its original shape for whatever the purpose is. So it's perfect for our skin, because if you pull on your skin and release it, your skin should go back to its original form, okay? Also in the walls of the arteries, because if your blood pressure or blood volume increases, all right, we need to accommodate that, all right? If there wasn't a lastin in those artery walls, when the blood pressure increases, we could burst a blood vessel. Right, the elastin makes it possible, amongst a couple other things, to accommodate all right, that increased blood pressure all right, or blood volume in that area there. All right, this next slide looks awful. <laughs> I don't know why it's like this, all right, but this is ground substance. And just basically to kind of talk to you, and I'll read it to you as best I can, the first portion here says non-cellular material produced by connective tissue cells. Okay. So the connective tissue cells, maybe the fibroblasts, will produce this, all right? They're not the only cell, but they're the main cell that will do that, all right? So this type of connective tissue, all right, is going to be where the cells, excuse me, not this type of connective tissue, this component of the connective tissue 
is basically where the cells and the protein fibers live in. Okay, so they're like the house. And the protein fibers and the, and the cells are like the residents of the house, the humans and the pets, let's say. All right. So the ground substance is where everything lives. Now, it, the consistency of the ground substance varies. All right. Anywhere from a liquid or viscous type of material, like our blood or our lymph, okay, it, to a solid state like our bones. We also have a semi solid state, which is the cartilage. Okay. And that last one there, I'm trying to read it, but that's a tough one. The ground substance. Oh, oh dirt. Okay. The ground substance. I'll write it out as best I can. Actually, I'll type it out. So the ground substance. All right. Plus the protein fibers equals the extra cellular matrix. Okay, boom. All right, so ground substance plus protein fibers equals the extra cellular matrix. Add the connective tissue cells to that and you have connective tissue. Okay, the next slide does not look like that. All right, so what is ground substance? All right, mainly it's water, okay? And then we have some large molecules that we've tossed into it, all right? So one of those types is what we call glycosaminoglycans or GAGs. And it's a large molecule that's found into, into excuse me, in the ground substance. But most importantly, and this is crucial, all right? It's a charged molecule that's going to attract positively charged ions or cations, all right? And the nice thing about that relationship here with these glycosaminoglycans and the attraction for some of the cations, perfect example, sodium. If you remember, I mentioned this before, water will follow sodium. It'll follow sugar too, glucose, but it'll follow sodium. So if these glycosaminoglycans can attract sodium, for example, or any other positive charged cat ion, all right, then the water will follow, okay? The next type of ground substance molecule are the proteoglycans, okay? So when our, our glycosaminoglycans, all right, attach themselves to a protein, you'll have these proteoglycans available, all right? And so most of the uh, proteoglycans, all right, when they're attached to that protein, all right, and we get these glycosaminoglycans, about 90% of that are going to be carbohydrates. And finally, our glycoproteins, all right, if you dissect the term glyco, all right, that's sugar, glucose, carbohydrate, and it's going to be a protein with a carbohydrate group attached to it, okay? Mm -hmm. Here's a quick picture of connective tissue components in the organization of the connective tissue. I want to take the time here quickly to talk about scurvy. All right. Scurvy is our first clinical um, condition that we're going to look at here in today's lab lecture. All right. And it's a condition you don't really see too often. All right. But it stresses just how important collagen is. Okay. As you know, collagen is one of our protein fibers. All right and it helps to add structure and, and integrity to cells, all right, and to tissue, I mean. And so we need vitamin C to make collagen, okay? So during the collagen synthesis uh, uh, cycle, okay, uh, vitamin C is used to pretty much cut off the ends of the collagen. When that happens, once we're able to cleave off the ends of that collagen, then we have a uh, 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 collagen that is going to be properly formed and we can and useful. We can use it, right? But without the vitamin C, we can't cut off or snip off those tapered ends. <clears throat> Excuse me. And when that occurs, then we have kind of inadequate collagen. Okay. And inadequate collagen does not offer strength and integrity to our tissue. Okay. And when we have a vitamin C deficiency, all right, you have the condition known as scurvy. And so all the tissues that that inefficient collagen is a part of, right, will have problems, 
All right, you'll see bleeding gums, gum ulceration. Hemorrhages usually along all right, the shins, all right, <clears throat> and that's because a lot of those tissues then allow bleeding to come through because they're not as strong. All right, collagen is a huge, huge component to the organic matrix of bone. So if you have garbage collagen going into the bone, then you're going to have abnormal bone growth. Okay, so mainly scurvy is caused from nutritional deficiencies. You're just not getting enough vitamin C uh, through, and you usually find that in citrusy uh, uh, fruits, okay, like uh, grapefruits, lemons. Uh, oranges and whatnot. Um, so if you see that in somebody uh, in today's day and age, they're either malnourished. If you see a, a case of scurvy in somebody in today's days, they're either malnourished um, and we're starting to see an uptick in the malnourishment or inappropriate diets, all right, in, in folks that live in the city, okay? They're just less likely to have fresh fruits and vegetables and whatnot, okay? Easy way to fix it, give them food uh, that is high in vitamin C, all right, or treat them with vitamin C supplements. All right, so we'll get to connective tissue. Here's the breakdown. I would strongly, strongly urge all of you <clears throat> to look at this slide and memorize it, okay? Figure 5.9, okay? Just to kind of give you the uh, understanding of connective tissue classification and organization here. So we're going to start off here with the mesenchyme tissue, and this is basically, you know, embryonic tissue, all right, fetal embryonic tissue, all right? <clears throat> and it will then turn into one of three types, connective tissue proper, supporting connective tissue, and fluid connective tissue, okay? Then we subdivide connective tissue proper into loose connective tissue and dense connective tissue. And then there's three types of specific connective tissue under each of those. Supporting connective tissue, just think of things that support your body, bones and cartilage. So you have cartilage, which there are three types, and bone, which there are two. And finally, for the fluid connective tissue, we have blood and lymph fluid, okay? All right. Let's jump into this real quick. The first type of connective tissue is connective tissue proper. All right, and we're gonna start off with the loose connective tissue, which is a subdivision of connective tissue proper. So if you think of loose, all right, you wanna think of very few cells, all right, and very few protein fibers. So what's left? Ground substance, and guess what? You got a lot of it. Lots of ground substance is going to be in loose connective tissue, okay? So, oops, there we go. So loose connective tissue is basically going to be your body's packing material. You'll, just found, you'll find it in just various places throughout the body. It's like a space filler, or if you go to the Oscars, a seat filler, okay? That's what it does. It also helps with support too. And there's three types, areolar, adipose, and reticular. Those are gonna be your three types of connective of loose connective tissue. So let's take a look. First type is areolar, okay? Very loosely organized, all right? You'll have collagen and elastic fibers present, all right? But there's not gonna be any type of organization to them. They're just gonna be haphazardly, you know, just thrown around, okay? But since we have a lot of ground substance and in tissues where there's a lot of ground substance, just kind of think of that as a wide open space, all right? Pretty much, um, inhabited by water, okay, and those uh, large molecules I was telling you about earlier, all right? So this, since it's so loosely organized and there's a lot of space for stuff, why not fill it with blood vessels? So areolar connective tissue will be highly vascularized. Lots of blood vessels coming and going, all right? It's good. It's a good thing, all right? So you'll have both types of cell, uh, cell types in there, all right, both fixed and wandering cells. All right, and our ground substance, which is, again, going to be abundant, is going to be more on the liquid or viscous side. So you'll find this, all right, type of connective tissue in our skin, the papillary layer specifically. And then there's a layer of tissue below our skin, which is called the subcutaneous layer, all right? And again, since it's packing material of the body, it's going to be found around the organs, 
all right, around our nerve and muscle cells, all right, and around the blood vessels. Okay? Packing material. Amazon likes to ship things to you and they'll pack it with those, uh, I don't think they use the styrofoam little uh, thingies anymore, but they use those inflatable airbags, <clears throat> all right? But that's still packing material, so your goods don't get damaged. Same thing here. Your body doesn't want, all right, its goods getting damaged. And if you look here <clears throat> on our slide here, you can see, all right, small elastic fibers, all right, and then you've got your larger uh, collagen fibers right through here, all right, and back here. And then you've got various cells just kind of spread out, okay? And then everything else, the white here is going to be your uh, ground substance. All right, the next type of loose connective tissue is going to be adipose. The predominant cell type in adipose is going to be the adipocytes, okay? So most times people refer to adipose tissue as fat, all right? And there's two types, white and brown, all right? White is pretty abundant in us as adults, all right? Brown, you're going to see more in uh, babies, new, uh, newborns. And it's big, the, the big purpose of brown is going to be to generate heat, all right? And as we grow older, we just start to lose it. There's, you still have some brown um, uh, adipose tissue, mainly, believe it or not, around your shoulder blades there, <clears throat> okay? But not too much, all right? It's the white that's going to be the one that is going to store the energy. All those triglycerides that were floating in your blood, all right, will be packaged up and, and stored in the adipocytes with lipids, all right? And it also acts as an insulator and cushioning, okay? So um, adipose tissue will fluctuate depending on your nutrition intake, all right? If you're always in an excess energy state, which means you just eat a lot, and I'm not trying to criticize anybody's eating habits, but just meaning, you know, your food, you're eating frequently, you have a lot of nutrients floating around, your adipocytes will absorb the leftovers and kind of convert what it can into lipids and store it, <clears throat> all right? Um, when you're in, in an energy depleted stage where you're not getting enough nutrition, say you're at sea in a lifeboat for several weeks, all right, you're not eating, okay? Then uh, your adipose tissue will start to shrink down because your body is gonna use the lipids, the stored energy uh, to help sustain itself, okay? Um, before I go back here, you can see here is just, we saw this similar picture. If you have looked at the lab slide identification lecture, you can see these are the uh, adipocytes, all right? And they're filled with lipids here, okay? <clears throat> the next type of loose connective tissue is reticular, all right? Reticular connective tissue, all right? Think of this, remember, as the, that storage facility there has a lot of little rooms there. So you will find lots of reticular fibers located in this type of tissue, all right? Leukocytes, the white blood cells, love to hang out here in these little rooms, all right? Just think of them as break rooms, and they're waiting, okay? Believe it or not, the majority of your white blood cells are not in circulation. They're hiding out in tissues, all right? Just relaxing, waiting to be called into uh, action, all right? We also have some fibroblasts there, all right? So these reticular fibers make this structural framework inside of these organs, all right, mainly our lymphatic organs, okay, and so a lot of your lymphatic uh, tissue or cells will hang out there, all right, mainly white blood cells, okay, so the spleen, the thymus gland, th and the lymph nodes and bone marrow, all right, bone marrow, the reticular uh, uh, framework there uh, is going to house your um, uh, the red bone marrow to make your blood cells. All right, that's for loose connective tissue. The next type of connective tissue proper is going to be our dense connective tissue. That's a little bit of a different story here. Where loose connective tissue had very few protein fibers and very few cells and, may, and a lot of ground substance. That's not the case here. All right, in dense connective tissue, we'll see mostly protein fibers. So you'll have very little to no ground substance. All right, so the protein fiber that actually is the king here or queen is going to be collagen fibers. They're the main type of protein fiber that you'll see here, okay? So we have three types. We have 
or dense regular connective tissue, dense irregular than the elastic tissue. So let's get into the dense regular connective tissue, all right? So this, again, if you look down at the picture there, you can see, all right, how nicely arranged, all right, this tissue is. All this is, is collagen fibers, all right, this pink structures here, okay? And so they're laid down on top of one another like lasagna noodles, all right? And there's very little white here is the ground substance. So you can see there's very little ground substance. And then scattered throughout, you're going to have your fibroblast cells, okay? Because the fibroblast cells are going to be what's making, all right, the collagen. So it's tightly packed, all right? The collagen fibers will be laid on top of one another. They'll be parallel to one another. It looks like lasagna. And you're going to typically find this mainly in tendons and ligaments. All right, and the nice thing about this type of connective tissue is that it's really strong when stress is applied to it in one single direction, which is a lot of times what tendons and ligaments all right, have to undergo. All right? The tensile strength of your Achilles tendon is so strong, you could hang a Volkswagen Beetle off of it, or a Fiat, all right, or a Mini Coop. All right, that's how strong it is in a healthy Achilles tendon. That's the largest tendon in your body, by the way. Okay, so since we have so little ground substance, all right, we cannot have a lot of blood vessels there. Okay, because remember, if you have a lot of ground substance, blood vessels will go into that ground substance. Okay, if you don't have much ground substance, then you're going to have very few blood vessels. And so therefore, because we have very few blood vessels, if this tissue becomes damaged, it takes a long time to heal because we don't have a lot of blood flowing to that area. And blood is going to bring in the stuff that we need to repair the damaged tissue. All right, our next type of dense connective tissue is going to be the dense irregular. Okay, so we'll have the collagen fibers in this type of tissue, all right, but unfortunately, they're not going to be nicely organized. They're not going to be parallel. They're just in these clumps, kind of swirly, twirly arrangements here, okay, which is fine, all right, because these collagen fibers are going to go in all these different directions. So it makes it, all right, quite useful to handle stress in multiple directions, i.e. your skin. If you're sitting there watching this, if you take your, uh, grab some of the skin on the back of your hand and pull it up away from your bone, from your hand, and just start to pull it in different directions, not hard, all right? These collagen fibers can handle that, okay? <clears throat> so they're very useful. So again, we're gonna find this type of connective tissue, all right, <clears throat> in one of the layers of your skin, the dermis, also in the periosteum, which is the, the covering of your bone, all right, and the perichondrium, which is the covering to your cartilage. And also we're gonna see it, all right, <clears throat> Uh, in the capsules that surround a lot of your internal organs, for example, the kidneys, all right? Also, they'll have this fibrous capsule that surrounds them. Your adrenal glands, same thing, okay? Helps to protect, okay? Offer support to those organs and tissues, all right? So that's the dense irregular connective tissue. And then the last type of dense irregular connective tissue, excuse me, the last type of dense connective tissue is elastic, okay? So the predominant protein type or fiber type in this type of tissue are going to be elastic fibers, but what we've done is we've packed these fibers, all right, uh, relatively tight, all right, because the, this type of tissue needs to withstand a lot of stretching and recoiling, all right? So we're going to see it in the walls of some of our large arteries, because we talked about that, elastic tissue, all right, needs to be able to uh, uh, withstand, all right, <clears throat> a lot of pressure changes, all right, when your blood pressure differentiates, trachea and the vocal cords, okay? All right, let's jump into the second type of connective tissue, which is going to be our supportive connective tissue. And our supportive connective tissue or supporting connective tissue okay, has two types, cartilage and bone, okay, so we're going to talk about cartilage first, and there's three types of cartilage, hyaline cartilage, all right, fibrocartilage, and elastic cartilage, so the most common type is the hyaline cartilage, okay, now hyaline cartilage does have a covering around it, and that's called perichondrium, 
because not all cartilage types have a perichondrium. Hyaline cartilage is one of those, okay? So we're going to talk about hyaline cartilage a lot throughout the course, right? especially when we get into Chapter 7 about bones. All right, so we're going to see this cartilage, all right, in areas scattered throughout some of your rib cartilage there, all right, when your ribs attached to the sternum, they have a hyaline cartilage attachment point there, all right. Um, bones, when they articulate with one another to form a joint, all right, for example, your knee joints, all right, or your shoulder joint, all right, the ends of the bones there, all right, that are going to, like in your fingers, your knuckles, have articular, excuse me, hyaline cartilage that coats those ends. We usually call it by a different name. We call it articular cartilage then, but it's the same thing, hyaline cartilage, okay? But it's going to cover the ends of the bones to pr help produce friction, uh, excuse me, to help reduce friction, all right? And it also acts as a shock absorber. And then when you start to grow uh, the skeleton, all right, when you're a fetus, all right, the skeleton, the fetal skeleton, all right, starts off as hyaline cartilage, and then it'll start to transition into bone. More on that in Chapter 7. All right, the next type of cartilage, one of my favorites, is fibro cartilage. All right, this cartilage literally does the heavy lifting. It's weight-bearing, all right? Its job, it needs to resist all these different types of compressive forces that act upon it, all right? And so this type of cartilage is going to be loaded, all right, with tons of protein fibers, mainly co uh, collagen. All right. Now, yes, they will be irregularly uh, uh, arranged, okay? But within, all right, the protein fibers, this is where we're going to see our chondrocytes. I'll show you the picture down below. Hardly any, all right, ground substance, but most importantly, it has no perichondrium, okay? None. So if you look at our picture down here, you can see all right, here's our chondrocyte, and chondrocytes live in this little compartment here, chamber or space, and that's called a lacuna, okay? The lacuna is the space or the chamber or the compartment, and the cell that lives inside is the chondrocyte, and it's the chondrocyte that makes what we call the cartilage matrix, which is mainly, all right, these protein fibers here, okay? So there's only, this type of fibro car, cartilage is only located in three places, the intervertebral discs in your spine, the pubic symphysis is where your two hip bones come together in the front and meet, all right, about two inches underneath your belly button, and finally the menisci of your knees, all right, which are those disc-like structures that sit in your knees to help to reduce uh, compression and act as shock absorbers there. All right, and then finally the last type of cartilage is going to be the elastic cartilage, okay? Elastic cartilage is obviously going to be predominantly made up of the elastic fibers, okay, because it needs to be able to resist, all right, those stresses and forces that act upon it. But this type of cartilage, if it's bent or moved in a certain direction or any type of movement, it needs to be able to rebound and recoil back to its original shape or configuration, okay? So it's going to be very flexible, all right? So this type of cartilage is going to have the chondrocytes very closely packed to one another. It also is covered by the perichondrium, okay? So we're going to see this in the pina or the oracle of our ear, which is that disc-shaped structure that sits on the side of your head, and also the epiglottis. That's this little flap structure that covers over the trachea, all right, or excuse me, the opening to your trachea, the glottis, all right, and when you're going to swallow something uh, food-wise or liquid-wise, uh, it will cover that opening until you're done doing that. All right, the next type of supporting connective tissue is bone, all right, and so this here is just going to be showing, we're going to get into much more detail about bone, all right, but this is a picture of compact bone, okay, and if you want to know a little bit more about it, watch the uh, identification slide. But these circular-like structures, those are called osteons. And at the center of them is a structure called the central canal. It's a space, okay? And that space has uh, blood vessels and nerves inside, all right? And then you have these ring-like layers that surround 
the central canal, much like a tree, all right? And within these uh, rings, which are called lamellae, you have these little black dots here. And those black dots are these spaces called lacuna, all right? And the lacuna is a space or a chamber in which a cell will live. And since we're talking about bone, the predominant cell type for bone is going to be what's called an osteocyte. Okay? So we'll get into more about this in the bone chapter. And then the last type of connective tissue, all right, overall is fluid connective tissue. All right? And then there's two types or subdivisions of fluid connective tissue, and that's blood and lymph. And this slide here is showing you, all right, blood. You've got your red blood cells or your erythrocytes, all right? And then you've got your white blood cells, which are these bigger cells here. All right, you've got a lymphocyte here. You've got a neutrophil here. And then it's tough to see, but you also have pla plasma. Excuse me, not plasma, platelets. And I can't really see. Hold on, i got to zoom in a little bit here. Oh, there it is. All right, here's a platelet. Okay, platelets are these small little dot-like structures. There's a slide um, in your lab, slide identification uh, video, that shows a better example because there's tons of platelets all over the place. But these little platelets, all right, are these tiny little dots that you'll see. Obviously, they're uh, a part of the blood clotting. And then our ground substance, all this white here, that's your blood plasma. Okay, that is going to be a fluid-like or viscous-like ground substance. All right, let's move on to the second tissue type. All right, the second tissue type is going to be muscle. Did I say second? Excuse me. The third tissue type. Our first tissue type is epithelial tissue. Our second tissue type, it, we just finished it, is connective tissue. Now, our third tissue type that we find in the body is going to be muscle. And there's three types. There's skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle, okay? So here you can see, all right, our skeletal muscle. It's a long cylindrical cell, right? This is one whole cell. But if you notice, on the cell, we have tons of nuclei, all right? So a skeletal muscle is what we call multinucleated, all right, because it has many nuclei. And there's a reason for that, which you'll learn when we, do, when we go over uh, skeletal muscle. All right, but you'll also notice that skeletal muscle has these striations, these alternating light and dark stripes, okay? And so basically that is going to be, all right, having to do with the different proteins that make up the skeletal muscle tissue, okay? Skeletal muscle cells are very long and they do not branch. All right, the second type of muscle tissue is cardiac muscle tissue. It's similar to skeletal in which it has striations, it has stripes, okay, and it can have more than one nucleus, all right. It can have one to two nuclei per cell. But one of the things that differs with cardiac muscle tissue is that, that the uh, muscle cell itself can branch. So you can see here, here's one portion of it that splits off into, all right, two branches here. <clears throat> and then you'll also notice these dark lines here. Here's one, here's one. Well, there's a better one. Those are called intercalated discs. And intercalated discs are basically where one cardiac muscle cell is going to be connected to another cardiac muscle cell. And they contain these structures called gap junctions and desmosomes, which help to make the cardiac muscle uh, tissue uh, much more effective and efficient during the contraction process. And it allows for the electrical signal, all right, to move through the cells much more effectively. All right. And then the last type of muscle tissue is smooth muscle tissue. And it's called smooth muscle tissue because there are no striations. Okay. They don't have striations, so therefore it's smooth. And they have a fusiform shape, which means that they're tapered at the ends here, okay? And uh, smooth muscle tissue only has one nuclei per cell, okay? And you will find this type of tissue, all right, 
throughout a lot of your digestive system, respiratory system, circulatory system, all right? Um, that's involuntary, you have no control over. Cardiac muscle tissue, the only place that you'll find cardiac muscle tissue is in the, the wall of the heart, the myocardium, and then skeletal muscle tissue, obviously, throughout your skeletal muscles all around your body. But skeletal muscle tissue is voluntary. You can control that, all right? Cardiac muscle tissue is involuntary. And finally, the last tissue type in the body is the nervous tissue, okay? We will find this type of tissue, all right, in the central and peripheral nervous system, that is the brain, the spinal cord, and the nerves, all right? Uh, the two types of tissue are neurons and glial cells, all right? The neurons are like the star of the show. We'll, t we'll spend a lot of time on them, all right? But their job is to receive information, transmit information, and also process information, okay? Then the other type of tissue, or excuse me, cell that's in this tissue are glial cells. They outnumber, <clears throat> all right, neurons. There's many more glial cells than neurons. But the glial cells are the support cells. They're like the entourage. Lady Gaga is the star of the show. She's the neuron. Then she has her entourage that is going to be supporting her, doing everything for her. All right. So that's what the glial cells do. Important to understand that they do not, do not transmit nerve impulses. They do not. Only the neurons do that. Okay. The neurons are the only ones. Okay. So their job is to protect the neuron. All right. They will provide nourishment for the neuron and get rid of the wastes. And they'll also help to support the neurons. Keep them in place so they're not moving around and banging around and stuff. Here's an awesome picture of that. Okay. You can see this is a picture of a neuron right here. Okay. And then you have glial cells in and around the neuron. So the, the here's the neuron, and it's got these processes coming off. All right, and these little dark dots scattered around, those are your glial cells. And we'll get more into the details of uh, nervous tissue when we get to that chapter in chapter 12. All righty, that <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me. That concludes the nervous tissue. And that, therefore, we are done with the lab information, uh, lecture lab information for uh, the tissues, okay? So take your time, uh, re-watch this video. If you have any information, again, we will be covering a lot of this material again in the lecture portion for Chapter 5 for tissues. So I hope you found this video helpful, and I will see you in class very soon.